Welcome to Southboro Access Media. This is a program that provides one example of how the Army developed a unique rehabilitation program in 1970 for Army soldiers with drug addiction problems, stockade inmates serving prison time, and discipline problem soldiers. This broadcast is dedicated to over 300 veterans who reside in Southboro, veterans of all wars, and those who are currently serving our country. We are very grateful for their service and their families who support them. There are three parts to this presentation about my military experience. The first part relates to my family's military heritage and their contributions to this country. It was their example that influenced my career in the Army. That influence enabled me to respond to the Army's call to action to address the issues our soldiers were facing at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The second part briefly reviews when I entered the Army during a decade of chaos when President John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King were assassinated. The anti-war demonstrations and riots were pervasive. The country was in flames. The war in Vietnam was not going very well, and the resistance to the military and the war was having a corrosive impact on the Army's effectiveness as a military force in Vietnam and bases throughout the country. The great hostility in the Army was extensive which was complicated by soldiers becoming addicted to drugs, being insubordinate, and committing crimes. The third part relates how the Army responded to this crisis and developed a unique and successful rehabilitation program called Spartan Pathfinder that I implemented during my tour of duty at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. At that time, I was 26 and a first lieutenant in the Army between 1969 and 1971. The program was designed to assist soldiers dealing with drug addiction, insubordinate soldiers, and imprisoned stockade inmates. It was our job to rehabilitate them in a manner that would enable them to become productive soldiers and obtain an honorable discharge when their tour of duty ended. Looking back on my life, I now realize that the confluence of my family's military heritage, the morale issues of our soldiers during the Vietnam War crisis, and my personal experience as an instructor with the Outward Bound School set the stage of how the Spartan Pathfinder program unfolded to help our soldiers who needed help. Here are highlights of my family's heritage and military history. Members of my family served in every major conflict since our nation's founding. We landed with the pilgrims on the Mayflower to escape religious persecution. My relative, Richard Warren, was a passenger. We fought during the colonial wars against England, the native Indians, and France to secure the land that would become our wonderful country. During the American Revolution, my relative, Dr. Joseph Warren, served as a general and fought to defeat the British. He died at the Battle of Bunker Hill that helped ignite the war for independence. And he was the one who gave Paul Revere the orders to notify the conquered militia that the British were coming. During the Civil War, my relative, Elliot Hanscom Robbins, a Union soldier, died at the Battle of the Wilderness in Virginia, which was fought to keep this nation whole and to free the slaves. His gravesite can be viewed in his hometown of Charlton, Massachusetts. Generations later, and in 1974, my older brother, the late Elliot Petrie Robbins, descendant of Union soldier Elliot Hanscom Robbins, married Mary Louise Graham, descendant of a Confederate soldier, Joseph Graham. 
Yes, time and love can heal old wounds. During World War II, my late uncle Hector Petrie, then a resident of Framingham, flew 30 missions as a navigator on a B-24 bomber over Germany. The Army Air Force crew suffered 60% casualties. By the grace of God, he survived. During the Korean War, my uncle, Michael Robbins, who is 91 and living in Brookline, served as staff assistant and interpreter for the Army headquarters in La Rochelle, France. In the 60s, my older brother, Elliot, served as a military policeman, and my twin brother, John, was a drill instructor. They both served in the Army Reserve. The start of my military career began in 1969 when I received a letter from the Selective Service Board stating that I was going to be drafted. Since it was more than likely that I would be sent to Vietnam, I applied and was selected to serve in the Army's Infantry Officer Candidate School. At that time, as I left my teaching job to join the service, there were no pats on my back, nor did anyone wish me well. Many of those drafted were sent to Vietnam. I would later learn that one of my best high school friends, First Lieutenant John Zier, a Marine, died from his battle wounds and is buried in Arlington Cemetery. I remember visiting his gravesite and feeling the pain of his loss and missing him greatly. That feeling has stayed with me my whole life. It was a scary and tumultuous time in the United States. Anti-war demonstrations were rampant. College campuses, cities, and even the Pentagon were besieged. It was a time when in 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated it was a shock to the nation and world. I was attending my economics class at Defiance College in Defiance, Ohio, when a classmate came bursting in, crying and telling us the president was dead. I was stunned. I'm sure many of you viewing this program were numb and speechless when we learned of this great tragedy. Who could ever forget that devastating day? In 1967, the Six-Day War between Israel and the Arabs created the prospect of world war as the Soviets mobilized to rescue their Arab foreign aid beneficiaries from any further humiliation. In 1968, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were assassinated. I requested a special leave of absence from my teaching job to attend Martin Luther King's funeral. There I felt overwhelmed and deeply saddened as I stood next to his open casket at his wake in Atlanta. At that time, our nation was engulfed in race riots across the country. I was working in Cleveland, Ohio, where shopkeepers armed themselves with loaded shotguns to keep their stores from being burned to the ground. Many of us were afraid to go shopping or to leave our homes. Restless mobs filled with rage were roaming the streets. Raw fear was in the air, and the Ohio National Guard carried their M16 rifles with ammunition and bayonets. With a country burning and a nation lacking strong leaders, my entering the Army was filled with personal anxiety of going to war and conflicted feelings about right and wrong. I was not against the war. However, I would learn years later of a special friend and a veteran who suffers from life-threatening health issues due to his exposure to Agent Orange. This was a lethal chemical used to defoliate the jungle vegetation in Vietnam. It made me question how our government and military leaders would let that happen to our soldiers.
However, not everything was doom and gloom. In 1968 and 1970, two bright moments interrupted the chaos. The Detroit Tigers defeated the St. Louis Cardinals for the World Series, with the Tigers winning in seven games for their first championship since 1945. Detroit went wild. In 1970, Carl Yastrzemski turned 30 and hit 40 home runs for a second year. Yes, we had something to celebrate. Starting in July of 1969 and during my first year in the Army, I attended four training programs. I started with basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. For two months, we learned the rudiments of how to become a warrior and how to stay alive in combat. While on leave, I had an opportunity to go home for rest and relaxation. I remember walking in New York City wearing my uniform. It was then I heard a stranger yell, Hey, Nazi! Yes, I was called a Nazi. I can still see that place on 42nd Street near Grand Central Station and hear that dark voice echoing across the throngs of people rushing by. It was a period when our men and women in the military were being treated as warmongers and killers. We were hated by many. That was when I stopped wearing my uniform in public. In later years, when I attended Army Reserve meetings on weekends, I would carry my uniform in a garment bag and place it in my trunk. I didn't want it to be seen and chose to avoid the possibility of my car being vandalized. During that time, I never heard one elected official ask that the blame for the war be redirected to the politicians who made the decision to send our men and women to Vietnam. We now know that our political leaders gave us false information about the progress of the war, which prolonged the conflict and caused unnecessary casualties. Then I was off to my next assignment at Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, where I attended advanced individual training. I learned skills to become a specialized combat engineer. Missouri was a place too cold for most of us. My friend from the sunshine state of Florida, Private First Class Art Richards, always wore three uniforms to keep from freezing to death he would often state. Next, I attended the Infantry Officers Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. I received outstanding training from highly qualified and committed instructors. We learned to be effective combat infantry leaders, enabling us to bring early defeat to the enemy. This is where I received my commission as a second lieutenant in the spring of 1970. After Officers Candidate School, I attended two months of training at Signal School in Fort Gordon, Georgia, to learn the art of establishing effective communication systems on the battlefield. With one year of training completed, I reported to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. There, I led a small unit within the Army Security Agency responsible for the security of Army communications and electronic countermeasure operations. For example, during military maneuvers by the Soviets in Europe, one of the agency's missions was to intercept their communiques for vital information. We also monitored Fort Bragg's phone lines, including headquarters to ensure no one was speaking about confidential matters. As I was settling into my assignment at Fort Bragg, I was surprised that there were many stationed there who held great hostility toward the Army and expressed strong resistance against the Vietnam War. I knew of one officer who was discharged due to his insubordination. This opposition was also evident in Vietnam and on some bases across the country. Acts of sabotage were being committed including race riots and refusals to obey orders. 
which often led to a discharge or prison time. Desertions were at an all-time high, and soldiers with drug addiction were returning from Vietnam. There was an unprecedented decline in morale among our soldiers who did not believe our military goals were clear, achievable, or worthwhile. The problems throughout the base escalated to the point that various command centers were meeting monthly to discuss how to address these discipline issues. During one session, a member of the committee learned that in civilian life, I had been an instructor at the Hurricane Island Outward Bound School in Maine that used the outdoors and high adventure programs to help young adults deal with drugs, poor behavior, and little motivation. I was then directed by Brigadier General Henry Emerson of Special Forces to develop a program at Fort Bragg to address these similar Army issues. The project was named Spartan Pathfinder and was given top priority for implementation. No expense or resources were spared to assist our soldiers in need. I was impressed about the deep commitment to launch this endeavor. The Spartan Pathfinder mission was to provide an intense controlled stress experience in a remote wilderness setting that challenged soldiers to break a pattern of failure. It was designed to build character, self-confidence, leadership skills, and to develop a sense of interdependence among their fellow soldiers. The rewards for a participant's success in completing the program included being welcomed back to their units, having personnel records expunged of negative evaluations, and becoming eligible for completing their existing tour of duty and obtaining an honorable discharge. During my two years stationed at Fort Bragg and working with exceptional officers and non-commissioned officers in Special Forces, we designed a 25-day outdoor program that rigorously challenged all participants. The course included rugged training techniques, cliff climbing and rappelling, survival training. Participants were placed alone in the wilderness for three days with a minimum of supplies. Service projects, soldiers learned to assist others. We helped firefighters extinguish forest fires in Montana and constructed a medical evacuation landing site to provide emergency helicopters a place to land in the event of a medical emergency in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. A confidence building ropes course for participants to traverse wide ravines. A five mile marathon with rucksacks was the last requirement for this 25 day grueling and demanding program before being returned to active duty. Other challenges included a 30-mile expedition with land navigation training. Participants were required to lead different aspects of the course to build their self-confidence and leadership skills. Each team was composed of stockade inmates, first-time offenders, individuals recovering from drug addiction, and insubordinate soldiers. We also had top-notch soldiers included within each team who served as role models. Participants were carefully selected and screened before and after the program to evaluate their fitness to return to their units. From 1971 through 1972, these programs took place in conjunction with military maneuvers in our national parks. Lewis and Clark National Forest in Montana, Tonto National Forest in Arizona, where I almost lost my life on the River Verde Rapids and learned how incredibly beautiful the desert is. The Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina, 
in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. Four Spartan Pathfinder rehabilitation programs were completed. Over 30 soldiers participated. We had a 60% success rate with 18 soldiers returning to their units to complete their tour of duty and later separating from the service with honorable discharges. One soldier felt so grateful he made a career of the military. A few years later, he would return to Fort Bragg and leave a note with a bottle of Shivas Regal at the front step of General Emerson's home. The note read, thanks again. The success of the program received great attention. We briefed General Westmoreland, Chief of Staff at the U.S. Army, who saw the need to improve the morale and welfare of soldiers both at Fort Bragg and elsewhere. He requested that the program be codified and distributed as a template to the major commands throughout the Army. General Westmoreland's precedent-setting decision sent a message to all levels of command and to our soldiers that the Army was committed to helping them. The implementation of the Spartan Pathfinder program was a unique example of the Army's initiative, creativity, leadership, empathy, and understanding the critical needs of its soldiers. The country's anti-war crisis was threatening the Army's ability to be an effective fighting force. However, there were leaders who responded and were deeply committed to finding a new way to address this challenge. It should be noted that throughout history, Exceptional leaders have always been concerned about the morale and welfare of their troops and the direct correlation to performance on and off the battlefield. Four examples include generals who had a common leadership trait, which was empathy. The Duke of Wellington defeating Napoleon in Waterloo in 1850. One of his first priorities in warfare was to take care of the wounded. When a few officers under his command neglected his directives to ensure his soldiers received prompt medical care, they were court-martialed. General Ulysses S. Grant, defeating General Lee during the Civil War in 1865, at the peace signing, Grant directed that the Confederate soldiers be sent home with their sidearms, horses, and personal gear. He was honoring those men to ensure their well-being and morale so they could rebuild their homes and communities. There were no court-martials, punitive measures, or prisoners taken. General Dwight Eisenhower in World War II, whom I met in 1963 when he was the graduation speaker at my college. During World War II, Eisenhower spent every possible moment visiting, inspecting, and showing deep concern for the welfare and morale of his troops. As a result, his commanders followed suit, which ensured ultimate victory. General Hank Emerson of Special Forces in 1971, he was fully committed and deployed all the resources necessary to ensure Spartan Pathfinder succeeded. In addition, those I worked with at Fort Bragg were meticulous about taking care of their warriors in terms of personal needs, their families, food, mail, health, and their overall well-being. The success of Spartan Pathfinder was a unique example of two important leadership skills adaptive leadership, listening to the junior officers and non-commissioned officers and responding to their observations about serious morale issues was the catalyst for starting the program. Exceeding the standard and stretching the rules in all that one does, Brigadier General Henry Emerson's responsibility was to train soldiers to teach armies in guerrilla warfare and to conduct special operations 
to ensure victory. While his unit was not created to conduct a rehabilitation program, he saw a disruptive situation with soldiers that had to be addressed. He was determined to give these soldiers an opportunity to succeed. I was given the responsibility to design and implement the Spartan Pathfinder program. The success was made possible by the exceptional assistance from officers, non-commissioned officers, medical personnel, the drug addiction center known as Operation Awareness, legal and psychiatric staff, a chaplain and sociologist, correction officers and logistical support teams who made an important difference for troubled soldiers who stepped forward and dared to change their own lives. Special recognition also goes to Colonel Joseph Love, commanding officer of the 7th Special Forces Group. Colonel William Tallon, deputy commander of Special Forces Headquarters, the John F. Kennedy Center for Military Assistance. First Lieutenant Dennis Twiggs and First Lieutenant Larry Michaud, who were all instrumental in guiding the coordination of the program through multiple military and civilian channels to ensure the smooth sailing of this great adventure. We stretched the rules and took the extraordinary risk of creating a rehabilitation program for our soldiers who needed help. It worked. I congratulated one soldier named Private First Class Eddie Quartz and said, you did it, you finished. He responded, no sir, I didn't finish, I have just begun. In conclusion, those returning from Vietnam were not welcomed home until just a few years ago. I vividly recall when I moved to Southboro in 1979, there were residents who would turn away to avoid talking with me because I was in the Army Reserve. Four years ago, I was invited along with other veterans to attend the Veterans Day Assembly at the Lincoln Street School in Northborough. The auditorium was full. The band was playing and students were cheering us and expressing their support and love. It was a tear-filled moment and I felt honored. Yes, I was proud to wear my uniform again and to feel welcome home. Thank you and God bless America. I also want to thank the Southboro Access Media team for making this possible and for all the support this community gives to its veterans. Music